Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the public at the Bulac. Welcome to our internet guests who are uh, listening um, uh, to this um, roundtable, which is aired uh, live uh, from the Bulac. And here I um, <coughs> might thank first uh, the people who made this possible, starting with uh, the ATLF, the Association of Traducteurs Littéraires de France. I need to try to translate um, live as well. And the Bilac, who host uh, this place and made uh, this podcast uh, possible. And here, if we are here, uh, we convene here to celebrate the centennial of the Westland. Um, the Beacon Poem of Modernity, um, which was first published in the Criterion, the literary review, T.S. Eliot, launched in October 1922, which review he ran until January 1939. Then thus the Westland was a kind of programmatic cultural stand as well as the model of um, modernist poetry and how best celebrate the afterlives of what is considered T.S. Eliot's masterpiece than with the translators who lended their voice. And by the very act of translatio, assess and testify for its fourth leben, as Walter Benjamin would say, that is the poem posterity, its continuous vitality, and its relevance today. For that matter, then, I'm very glad to welcome on stage Carmen Gallo from Italy. Carmen is a poet and research fellow at Sapienza Università di Roma, whose poetic and critical work was awarded several prizes. And she wrote also a book on metaphysical poets and Eucharistic imagination, Don Herbert Crashaw, poets that were very close uh, to T.S. Eliot, who did a big job to put them forward, for which she, she won the Tempera Book Prize. Last year, she published La Terra Devastata, which is a new edition of the Westland. And then we have Norbert Hummelt from Germany. Norbert is also a multi-prized poet and essayist. His new translation of the Westland came out in 2008 under a new title, Das Öde Land. He also translated the Four Quartets, and this year he published 1922 Wunderjahr der Worte, about this miracle year 1922, who saw the publication of Joyce, Ulysses, and T.S. Eliot, The Westland. And then we have Andreo Jaume from Spain. Andreo is editor, critic, teacher, translator, and poet and his Tierra Balda was republished this year with a new foreword. And he's also well acquainted to T.S. Eliot uh, because he also translated the Four Quartets. And he recently wrote a very insightful new foreword for a new edition of Ulysses in Spanish. And foreword that can be read in French on Le Grand Continent website. Last but not least, we have Benoit Tadier from France. Benoit is professor of, of American literature at Université Paris-Nanterre. He is a renowned specialist of modernism and of American hardball detective stories. And we see that it's, it's not that far stretched. There are connections. And he wrote an in-depth history of this um, detective style in 2018. And he offered a new and recent translation of The Westland also under a new title, La Terre, La Terre Dévastée, and a brilliant interview with Chloe Thomas, that some of you heard earlier, commenting on this translation, which was published in Transatlantica, um, at this the interview. And we also have in the public Cesar Sanchez from Peru and Dean Slavic from Croatia, who also translated the Westland in their language, and who are welcome to add in. So please give them a warm welcome and we'll jump into the discussion. (laughs) 
So we have structured this round table in four unequal parts. Uh, first, our guests will give you their own appreciation of the wasteland, um, what it means for them, how they approached it. And um, in the second part, they offer you a masterclass of translation that will be a real gift. Uh, from an excerpt, uh, each one has chosen for its specific uh, difficulty. Then, it will be the perfect time to ask questions they may or may not answer. And the fourth part is a surprise, so I won't tell more. So let's start with your beginnings and your ends. So um, I need the first candidate to jump in and to answer this very first question, which is what led you to the wasteland in the first place? It's knowing that none of you was the translator Princeps for very good reasons, since the poem is a hundred years old. So, I'm starting. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you, Pascal, and thank you, uh, all of you, for being here. Actually, the first reason was a personal one. Uh, I started writing poems, uh, reading The Wasteland, so there was a sort of feeling of gratitude and the resentment at the same time, <laughs> mostly gratitude, but it sounded like a sort of revenge against Eliot. The second reason is quite common. I think that is, it can be shared. The truth is that translation styles do change over time. The interpretation of classics do change over time, as well as our sensibility towards poetical language. And so after um, studying metaphysical poetry, Elizabethan drama, I had a few experiences as a translator, translator of Shakespeare, uh, Larkin, uh, Dylan Thomas. I thought that time had come <laughs> for at least trying to uh, provide Italian readers with uh, um, a more, if I can say, respectful um, translation, uh, more respectful of rhythms and the variety of register, but I think we will talk about it later. And I also wanted, and uh, I heard uh, during the discussion before, we were talking about translation as interpretation. I wanted also to offer a less mythological and more historical uh, interpretation of the poem based on the idea that uh, uh, Eliot's uh, me definition of mythical method is not only about using myth, but using myth to, uh, you, you know it <laughs> better than me, to give order, significance, controlling uh, the chaos, the futility and anarchy of contemporary history. So my attempt was to focus on uh, contemporary history and Eliot's attempt to give shape and significance to its chaos, in a sense. So, so somehow, next? Carmen, you were trying to modernize the modern. So <laughs> maybe it's something Norbert Woods was mm. wanted, trying to, by renewing the ancient translation of... Um, well, um, um, I have been living with this poem for, um, I think, about uh, more than 20 years before I uh, started to translate it. And I d even didn't uh, think of translating it. I listened to it and, and uh, Eliot's uh, reading of it. And, and I, uh, I read it um, no, well, really uh, quite often. And, uh, and I had to tell everybody about this poem, uh, which I love. But um, my translating Eliot started actually with the four quartets, and I did that for a long period of time, just for myself, without the thought it might uh, get published, which it later on did, but I, um, uh, there was no one waiting for it, so I could be very, very slowly, and, and I took uh, bits and pieces, um, which helped me often when I had a writer's block with my own poetry. Then I c could uh, turn to Eliot and dig into the four quartets. And um, more than once, I could uh, find back into my own writing after that. Um, with uh, The Wasteland, uh, it was totally different when I came to translate it, because it was, in a way, um, public at once. Because 
um, I was asked to do a literary internet project and then I decided, okay, I will do The Wasteland and offer it as a, a translation in progress. And so actually on the um, site of the Literaturhaus Bremen in 2007, I published one section, um, not the large sections, but I think 12 portions of it ev every week for, for three months. And then, then it um, got printed in, in a journal without the notes, but with my uh, notes on translation, and then it was published, of course, with the notes in book form. But my, my approach, uh, I should say, is um, more on the side of the music, um, because uh, there are two other um, translations in German which are still in, in print. Um, uh, Ernst Robert Kotzius has been mentioned already. Uh, his, um, I, I think, very, very good first translation from 1927. And then If I Hesse 1972, which I don't like so much. But, um, uh, uh, you know, um, um, translations uh, always um, age faster than the originals. And so I wanted to, to give the poem a, a fresh sound. So I think it's still very fresh uh, in the original, but I wanted to do something about uh, the music. Thank you, Lorenzo. And Andrew, uh, in Spain, there are quite a few translations still in print. So why this urge to add a new one? Yes, um, first of all, I want to thank you uh, it's a pleasure to be here for organizing this to you, Pascal. And it's a pleasure to be here with my fellow translators to celebrate this uh, centennial of the wasteland. And thank you for everybody who has made this possible and to all of you here. Well, yes, I've been always interested in Eliot since my teenage. Um, um, really, really obsessed. I. I I began to read him when I was 15 or so through a Spanish, very good Spanish poet called Jaime Gil de Viedma, who was one of, of uh, the first translator, translator of Eliot's essays in Spain. And uh, when I became an editor, I made a selection of his criticism, which was called uh, La Ventura Sin Fin. And in doing so, I realized that the extant translations in Spain were only literal to my taste or unsatisfying, especially the one by Jose Maria Valverde, who, on the other hand, was a very fine professor and critic and whose memory I honor. The uh, translation of Ulysses, uh, for which I wrote the foreword, uh, is his translation. I think it's a very good one. I have updated it to celebrate the centenary of the work, too, but. I mean, I have really a, um, I worship the, the memory of, of Alberti, but I think his poetic translations were not no such so good as his translations of prose or fiction. And so I decided that um, I would like to do my own translation of the Wasteland. By that time, I was more interested in the four quartets than in the Wasteland, but I thought that I should somehow a rave later to the four quartets. I couldn't translate that poem being very young, <laughs> and uh, I needed some experience, and I needed to understand what had been the development of uh, uh, Eliot's mind through the years, um, to study his critical evolution, to study he, the, the evolution of his verse as well, and then when I began to translate first the Prafok, which I, I have included in my edition, I began to understand uh, that the whole of Eliot is like, um, has more coherence than, than I, I, I thought in the, in the first place, in the beginning. So I began to see the whole work of Eliot, including the dramas, including the, the work for the theater as an organic one and uh, developing, uh, slow developing towards a new language in poetry, which was his obsession. And then I would, uh, I tried to do a poetic translation, the poetic in the sense that had um, 
try to render somehow the form as well as the content and the semantic level as well as the phonetic one. And as you said, and it was a, a, in Eliot's idea as well, uh, every generation must retranslate uh, the classics, so must somehow appropriate them. Thank you, Andrew. So, Benoit, maybe you can tell what I was hinted at uh, <coughs> while I was introducing you, that you, on the one hand side, write a story of a hardball detective, and on the other hand, you translate, you give us a new translation of the Westland. So, was it a kind of detective search? Were you looking for something particular in the Westland to reveal to your readers? Well, um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I don't know if I can answer it myself. The, I think I, I use one to rest from the other, really. Uh, but at the same time, I believe that they belong to the same period and that uh, we have had this for a long, very long time, this sort of high literature vision of T.S. Eliot, which sort of uh, cuts him off also from a general audience. And it's probably important to uh, take at least part of him back from that and give him uh, to the sort of the normal reader, if I may say so, that is not necessarily an academic reader. Um, I've always thought that the, um, the great modernity of the wasteland has been uh, not properly assessed in France. And in fact, um, there was never really a reception of the wasteland in France, as you will explain to us when you, this is exactly what you're working on. But um, it's a very strange thing that with all the um, massive impact of American and after all, I see that as an American poem, uh, of American literature in France between the two world wars, uh, the wasteland should not have been noticed or translated. And that when it came after the Second World War, um, in the wake of the Nobel Prize and with the quartets already uh, there at the same time, I think it completely blunted uh, the effect of that text on the French audiences. And, and so when you had the uh, 1947 translation of uh, Elliot's poetry that came out, the, what for me is a very great difference and uh, also a great temporal difference between the Wasteland and the Quartet seemed to have been completely erased in, in the French perception. And therefore, Eliot was seen, as, as we all know, as a sort of eldest statesman of, of poetry, um, the Nobel Prize, the, uh, someone who was no longer young, um, who was also uh, definitely religious and, and presented himself as such. Um, all that sort of, I think, completely... Um, blurred what uh, an earlier reception of the wasteland might have been had he been properly translated in the early 20s. So I realized there was this translation uh, in the late 20s, but I don't think it made much of an impact at the time. So that was one reason, I think, a sort of dissatisfaction, um, not so much with the French translation as it came out in 47. It was, after all, um, valid enough for its time. But I think it um, there was never uh, a chance for... Um, a French public to actually see how modern this text was, um, how discordant it is, how multivocal it is, how also it tends to um, blend in this uh, one utterance, both a sort of register of the of high poetry, a memory of blank verse from the Elizabethan period, at the same time as colloquial expressions, all these sort of things that are that jar in the English text uh, were not felt, I thought, in the French. Of course, it's very difficult to translate them, but that was like, like the challenge for me, uh, basically. The four of you um, are, are saying that you, you're kind of answering sort of dissatisfaction and, um, and a try, an actualization of the poem, and when we discussed this earlier, Van Paul Andrew, you say that the poem called for translation. Eliot said every generation should, but the piece of work itself, because the Westland is quite a particular poem, like any poem, it, but this one with all this polyphony, uh, its all level of languages, there is something with its foreign quotes, there is something that call for it, and because you are translators, and there are many translators here and in the air, so maybe we can look up a little bit in the kitchen, how you work the craftsman shop, and I was wondering, since we are in the realm 
of retranslation. What are you doing with the translation that were before? Do you set up without reading, reading them? Do you read them and forget about them and try to do something else and have a fresh approach? Do you read the critic that has been so? I'm, I'm it's going to your, your first point. I think it's quite interesting to talk to discuss about this because uh, it is generally accepted that modernist literature is more or less un untranslatable, or that it is very difficult to translate, or almost impossible to translate. For instance, Joyce Eliot at this stage of his work. But one of the reasons uh, why I included Prafog in my edition was to show to what degree Eliot had uh, somehow worked in French in the beginning of his work and thought in French, trying to avoid and trying to uh, supersede and uh, run away from the domi dominant way of thinking of Romanticism through blank verse and through all the inherited prosody of the English tradition. So, <clears throat> the wasteland is, uh, to a large extent, the result of Eliot's previous work and of Eliot's younger work, and especially, of course, of Prafrock, and of all of his uh, plunge in in, in, the, in the French symbolism, in the lesser symbolism, as Jules Afork and, and, and Tristan Corbière. Hmm? So, from the very beginning of the poem, the first stanza, uh, The Wasteland is a poem that lives in translation. So, I think that uh, the modernist works uh, ask for, to be translated much more than the classical ones who are very rooted in a language, in a country, in a more secluded, somehow, tradition. And uh, Joyce himself said that he wanted to invent a new language, because English, uh, somehow, um, was a sort of a jail for him, because encircled him and his work into a tradition that he wanted to somehow uh, broke. And Eliot was not so radical in that sense, but there is, there is something of this. And I think that, if we could say, in a very Walter Benjamin way, the um, fulfillment, the real fulfillment of the wasteland is through translation. So the four of us here are really doing the best homage to, to, the, to this uh, poem with this translation that never end, because the translation is always a process, a leaf process. The, the original is quiet, and the original is always present, and the translations always uh, get old sooner or later. So you have to translate in order to interpret and to uh, have a life. So, uh, Carmen, we what? Yeah, actually, in, in my case, I um, had studied at least the three of uh, the Wasteland translation as a student. So. Uh, willingly or unwillingly, <laughs> I had them in my mind when translating. And it was interesting because it was a sort of dialogue with previous translation. And I liked it because it was, no, it was like Andrea was saying, it was like being part of a greater attempt <laughs> over the years to not really to actualize the, the text, but it's like, you know, every translator, every generation can find a new key to new doors, not the same doors. Yeah. Mm? And uh, <laughs> so uh, that's make uh, sensible to try <laughs> new translation every time. And uh, you were also talking about criticism. Well, we had uh, the letters that were, the volume of letters that had been published recently and previous translators couldn't, um, were not avail available to them. And for me, at least, it was a great, of great help using Elias Letters, uh, his thoughts during um, his writing of the Wasteland. So it's important, I think, uh, to update also this kind of knowledge about the poem. Well, um, in, in my case, um, uh, um, I really, when, when I decided I, I would do this translation, I was. Um, uh, 
I, th I think it. I thought it. Uh, it really has to be done because the uh, most present translation from 1972 by Eva Hesse is. Um, I think it's. It is too um, extravagant and complicated, and um, um, Eva Hesse, of course, was a very. Um, uh, was very much into Ezra Pound. She uh, translated, I think, all of the cantos, and she was an expert and lifelong addict of, of Pound. Um, but uh, I always felt when I read her translation that she, from the lofty heights of Pound, she looked down upon Eliot a little bit. Uh, and she uh, wanted to annoy him even by her translation. That was what I felt. So, uh, And I... I uh, uh, so I wanted to correct that, and uh, which means to, just to say one example. Um, uh, Eva Hesse has some very uh, strange and uh, sought for um, um, formulations, even where Eliot is very simple and direct, which he can also be. For for instance, Unreal City. Um, uh, Eva Hesse translated as Wahnschaffende Stadt. Wahnschaffen, it, it's a, it's a um, Wagner word, I, I think. And of course, there is Wagner in the um, in the poem, but uh, but uh, this annoyed me in in place of Eliot. So I thought, no, it, um, uh, it has to be more direct and uh, where it can be direct. And uh, this was one of my intentions, but I uh, I hadn't uh, this uh, or Courtesy's translation always on my desk when I was uh, working on my translation. But for for certain um, lines where I uh, couldn't go on with it, uh, uh, I said, okay, let's see what the colleagues have done and then think about something. Obviously, uh, obviously Benoit, you, you, you had a translation because it was the the only one. And then you have all the scholarly work. So you could be tempted to, to put all this critical uh, work that was unknown at the time. And maybe you were kind of the uh, inverse, uh, reverted excess. Uh, the first translator may not have had all the knowledge of all the clues, mysteries of the Westland where we go into details later. But then you have all this knowledge, so how you deal with that? Well, I think you have so much now that you're completely buried under it. If you look at Christopher Rick's edition, there's so many footnotes and possibilities that if you start looking into that, you won't write a whole uh, single line, I think, because you're going to say, how am true. I going to get yeah, all this stuff true. into my yeah. translation? <laughs> So I was glad I had actually done mine w way before. It was not published for the reasons that we mentioned before, uh, linked to copyright and stuff like that. And um, and I never looked at uh, other translations uh, because I thought I don't want to do the same. I, I had a, an idea of what it was like, but I never opened it once I had started uh, translating myself because I thought I might be influenced not so much in doing the same, but in trying to do the opposite, which is almost as bad or perhaps even worse. So I said, I'm not going to look at it at all and just think, you know, in terms of what your own idea of the poem is. I had uh, this impression, however, which lingered in my mind that the French translation that existed used too many words. And uh, whereas I have this feeling of Eliot as a writer whose uh, style is very lean and spare and sinewy at times, a bit like, you know, what Pound always said about writing clear prose as the model for poetry, and this way he has of introducing a whole situation in just a few words. Um, I think you should try and give that capacity to really, in, in a very few words, um, create a scene. So be as even at the risk of not unpacking all these mi meanings and not getting all the references in, um, try to be as concise as possible, as close to the texts. And, and also not to, I mean, there are bits which I find really obscure in the wasteland, and I thought, you know, I, I should try to give something really obscure in French as well. I don't want to sort of explain. I'm not going to write footnotes, and I don't want to make it clearer than it is, so accept the difficulty is another thing. The first difficulty with the Westland starts with its title. Um, there have been a lot of um, works said on, on the very title. Most of you, majority, you change 
the title, the canonical title of the tradition in your country. Um, so maybe you can um, explain was it your choice, or maybe it could be the publisher's choice because there is some could be some marketing uh, thought behind that. But I guess there are also some semantic meaning uh, stakes behind the title. So. Um, well, uh, maybe I, I start on this. Um, the um, original, uh, the first the, um, title, there was uh, one translation in German before Coltius even, but it wasn't published then, and, and it's still uh, uh, not really uh, known and read in Germany, but it was uh, written in uh, Romania by German-speaking Romanian uh, poet Alfred Margul Sperber, he called his translation Ötland, in one word, Ötland. But then um, Ernst Robert Kurtius chose um, Das Wüsteland, and Eva Hesse also titled Das Wüsteland. And I always felt this is, um, in uh, German, a false friend, because um, it's of, of course the sound is very close, waste, wüst, uh, we have this uh, similarity between the German and Eng English language, but uh, it, it really is a um, false friend because in this case Wüst, Wüste is not the noun, it's the adjective. The, um, the noun Wüste is the desert and I would say that that would be um, okay as an association. But um, um, I, um, maybe uh, other German-speaking people might correct me, but uh, when we have the adjective Wüst, I think it um, means more like um, untidy. And so I uh, opted for uh, das öde Land, of which is, of course, also um, present in the poem itself by the uh, Wagner quote, Öd und leer. Das Meer. And I, um, I was surprised when my um, translation got published. There were, of, there are always critics. Maybe they would have liked to do it themselves or what. So they were very critical about certain aspects, but surprisingly not about the new title. I don't know why. Okay, uh, the title. Uh, actually, I have the impression that in Italian. Mm, culture is a little bit more conservative in the field of translation. But actually, the same reception of Eliot, uh, I was thinking about what uh, Benoit was saying about uh, the reasons why Eliot was not really liked in France. And they are precisely the reason why he's so much loved in Italy. <laughs> you know, he's the religious, uh, he is perceived like, you know, not to. Uh, very conservative. And so when I decided to change the prevailing and canonical title for almost a century, and, uh, you know, this kind of act is perceived like a sort of uh, rebellion or blasphemy, something like that. Actually, none of them. <laughs> uh, the previous title, the canonical title, is uh, La Terra Desolata. And I always thought that the salata sounds too romantic, sounds too psychological, sounds too atemporal. And while um, I didn't decide it uh, at the beginning of my work, it was not the publisher's idea, it was my fault, completely my fault. And I had this, this idea at the end of the writing of the commentary, of the long commentary accompanying my text, because I was describing all the wastelands in the poems, uh, in the poem, uh, Carthage, sacked, destroyed, and scattered with salt. Then you have Tiresias Thebes, the Greek city that is devastated by plague. Then you have the biblical landscape of Ezekiel, destroyed by God. Then you have also uh, the Fisher King's land was once a rich land that now is a wasteland because of the king's weakness, uh, the impossibility of the king to defend his land is what uh, provokes um, the land to be abandoned, uncultivated, and threatened by what Jesse Weston calls the ravages of war. So also in the medieval um, literature, a wasteland 
is not a, a, an empty space or just a barren land. It's something that is being devastated by someone <laughs> or, that, or by something. Something happened in the wasteland. It is not like that since the beginning. And so I thought that these kind of images, together with the heap of broken images, and together with the, the same fragmented nature, style of the poem, they were better expressed by La Terra Devastata. It sounded more like uh, coherent with all the um, uh, formal and thematic aspects of the poem. Perhaps I can just uh, continue because I have the same title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I you can on you. The, you can explain the late in part. You well, can no, do thank the you for <laughs> having said all that because you, you give me reasons for having chosen my own title. Uh, and thank you also to Jennifer for making all this comparison between all these translations in French, which I didn't know about, and some of them at least. And uh, it's interesting to see the variety of titles. Um, I agree with you completely. For me, it was something to do also with the, the idea of a post-war poem, so it suggests this also. Um, and the fact that um, philologically, if I may use a big word, uh, it's the same root, uh, whereas um, Ven uh, is not, which was the title used for uh, Lyris's translation. Also, if I can be a bit nasty, I think Terven doesn't mean anything, really. Uh, when you think about it in French, it just uh, has little meaning. Um, it doesn't speak to the mind. Um, Gast, we said, was all right. That's even philologically closer, but then it's not present in contemporary language the way wasteland is also, in the sense of a, an untilled place or an abandoned piece of land or whatever. So by default, I think I, I came to the same conclusion. Yeah, if I can add just one thing, that um, waste and devastated come from the same Latin word, that is vastus, which means empty space, but it is, uh, once again, um, a land which is destroyed to the point of becoming empty. It's not empty from the beginning. And uh, about gast, because in Italian there were some attempts to translate it as la terra guasta, or il paese guasto, that is in Dante's Inferno. But I think th the problem is not only that you need the vocabulary, it's also, you know, if uh, translation is always also a, a political art, in a sense. If you choose uh, in medieval words in the title, somehow you're saying that that kind of literary work has a kind of relationship with the past. If you choose not to put that element in the title, you're saying something else. If you're using a word that is still uh, in common language, you are posing that work in a different relationship with its past and with the past of the literary tradition, just to, it was, it was in the discussion we had in the, in the afternoon. Well, I'm, I'm the exception here because I didn't change the title. I, I decided to keep the canonical one in Spain, La Tierra Baldia, because I think it's a very good one, really. I think Baldia is a very nice, very beautiful uh, adjective. It's a very common word still nowadays in the country for meaning a soil where you cannot uh, sit or grow anything, uh, which, which is no, no good for harvest. But at the same time, um, to do something in balde is to do something in vain, uh, useless. So it has a um, polysemic um, meaning which fits very well with, I think, with the waste land. Uh, for quite some time I thought maybe to change to la tierra gastada, uh, uh, which one, one uh, Catalan translator, a very good one, was a fine poet and critic, Joan Farate, used but of course in Catalan there is no Baldia. And it's interesting because Baldia uh, is, no, is not a Romanic word. It's an, uh, it comes from, from Arab. It's an Arabic root. So that's why maybe there's no in, in Italian or in French. But I think the precise translation in, in Spanish is uh, La Tierra Baldia. Um, I've been surprised that I know not a single one of the translations that uh, 
has been had been done in in Latin America uh, that you first mentioned this morning. Maybe uh, no, there, there was no translator that used uh, Baldia. Ah, oh, okay. Okay, because the the, the, yeah, the majority were devastada or agostada even, no? Yerma, Yerma too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by, by your answers, you're hitting at, at another point of, um, of, of the poem. Maybe notice that we try progressively to, to um, give you an idea of what this poem represents for uh, poetics in Europe at least because we are between Europeans. Um, they are, the, the, the Western is at the hinge of, 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 of the tradition and modernism. You said earlier that um, it sum up or synthesized all the avant-garde work um, Eliot was doing in his earlier poems. So we have a kind of mosaic of what he was doing but still fitting it in his tradition. And then we have these two ghosts that haunt the, um, the Westland, the, 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 the ghost of the iambic pentameter, which is this little music that is broken, and the ghost of the sonnet, which is quite a European form. And I was wondering in each of your poetic tradition, how, um, how you transferred the Aryan big pentameter game within so, um, um, somehow fitting his tradition and his talent in yours. How have you done that? Uh, well, um, I must say that I, I, I would have to, to, to look up my translation to, to be precise. Um, but um, I, th I think there are um, passages that work very well in, in German following the uh, yeah, I am big pentameter. But there are also passages where I had to change uh, the meter and I felt free to do so because uh, 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 you have to do so. Uh, this morning I was just thinking about uh, another um, Eliot, not T.S., but uh, Mama Cass Eliot, who said, or rather sang, make your own kind of music. So, And I think you have to do this uh, in, in translation, uh, not, uh, not um, uh, deliberately all the time. It's, it's great when you can follow uh, what you find in the original, then and it's it's really a joy uh, uh, to see it works in in your language. You can follow uh, the meter, and it doesn't. Uh, it sounds natural. That that's what very is very important for me. It has to sound um, natural. It must be flowing. But uh, um, if it doesn't work in in this um, meter, you have to think of uh, something else. And I. Uh, I think later on I, w I will um, give an example uh, for that. But um, uh, as to, to the sonnet, of course, there is a sonnet tra a tradition also in uh, German poetry, but we also, uh, we always are very aware that it's not basically our own tradition. Uh, we have, we, uh, uh, there is the Petrarchan sonnet, and there is the Shakespearean sonnet, and it's always like uh, imported. Uh, I mean, better to import uh, foreign um, forms than foreign gas, maybe. Uh, but but um, uh, it. Uh, I was curious because I, I um, when when we did our Zoom meeting three days ago, when you presented this as a two. Goes haunt the wasteland, the iambic pentameter, and the sonnet. I was thinking, oh, how many sonnets are hidden in in the poem? I didn't even know that. <laughs> that's why they that's why they are called ghosts. Uh, yeah. As for me, uh, I'll be very short on this. Um, uh, I decided to use verso sciolto 
so I'm not following the iambic pentameter, but I'm trying to mix uh, the um, Italian syllabic tradition with a particular attention to uh, pattern of accents. So I try to mix these two kinds, and um, for this I refer to some um, Italian contemporary poets, mm, 20th century poets, uh, which were much influenced by Eliot. So I had much of the work done by them because in their works already there was already this kind of metrical reception or this kind of influence. So I try to do my best <laughs> mixing the two. Uh, that was a very important point to me, um, because as you can see in his criticism, Eliot regards the poetic form always as a way of thinking. Uh, as he himself stated in his great essay uh, about Dante, published in 1929, Dante thought inter zarima. Hmm? And the English tradition, as I mentioned earlier, um, in the English tradition, Yambi Pentameter since uh, Wyatt and, and Surrey, uh, had been the main instrument of all major poetry from Marlowe to Shakespeare to Milton and the Romantics. No? And now, from the very beginning of his career, I think it's quite an interesting thing to point out. Eliot was looking for a new way of thinking uh, in English poetry, and he knew that to do so, he had to avoid or to overcome the Yambi Pentameter, the blank verse. And that's why he turned to the French poetry, to the symbolist poetry in the first place mainly to, um, to the lesser symbolist, always to the, to the lesser Elizabethan uh, poets, contemporary to Marlowe and to Shakespeare, outside the main dominion of the Romantic tradition, which embodied a way of thinking, a Weltanschauung, that he wanted to supersede. For instance, the very first line of the Wise Land, April is the cruelest month, it's a direct stroke against uh, Yambic pentameter music. It's a... It, uh, it has a trochaic rhythm. It's not an exact trochee because it's very difficult to, to transpose the old Latin and Greek uh, measures into modern languages. But there is, and of course you can translate that because that happens within uh, the language and the tradition. But you have to find, and that's what I try to do, you have, you have to find a sort of uneasiness in your own language to render this work that Eliot was doing with the inherent tradition, which I think is very important. Um, for me, I think it is um, a different kind of situation since we have absolutely no metrical tradition in French, uh, obviously, uh, since uh, we don't, well, <laughs> we have a syllabic tradition, but we don't use meters in the sense of having different stress patterns, and so um, we have to think of something that is an equivalent to that to represent the the sort of ghostly presence or the haunting of the poem by iambic pentameters, in which case I think uh, that the alexandrin, the dodica syllable, functions quite well because it was kind of, again, a sort of dominant uh, pattern, um, as you said, from Racine on um, uh, until the early 20th century, until... Um, probably Apollinaire, who uh, was a bit in the fr history of French poetry, the same thing as Eliot or Pound might have been, and that of uh, English-American poetry, the man who got rid of uh, the traditional verse form, but who nevertheless used it beautifully at the same time. And when you look at a poem like Zorn, uh, 1913, which is the opening one of Alcol, which is kind of the foundational text of uh, modern poetry in French, uh, you realize that there are uh, classical lines that are there at the same time as there are broken lines. Uh, um, he's still attached to them, um, thinking uh, about them and using them beautifully, but at the same time get, getting beyond them. And I think this is perhaps what the kind of tension and ambivalence which you find in Eliot, who probably wanted like Pound to break the pentameter and at the same time was very much so attached to a kind of uh, metrical vision of uh, language or verse that he said that he didn't know what free verse could mean. So you have this tension in Eliot, and I think the way that I tried vaguely to uh, transpose it, of course it's imperfect, was to try and give some regular patterns when I thought that he was uh, also producing them, usually for ironic reasons. For example, in the, sequ the pub sequence with the two women talking, you have some 
slang or cockney uh, um, superimposed on a iambic pentameter here and there. So creating a sort of effect of discordance. Or vice versa, you can also read it as the idea that in popular talk there is still the sort of poetic rhythm that has uh, died in other spheres of society. I think if you have a more democratic vision of Eliot, it could also work like that. And so this is the kind of place where you wanted to enhance the formal effects. And the same with the sonnets, I think they work in the same way as a kind of uh, ironic device uh, in these because the sonnet is really associated with Renaissance and love poetry and um, and lyrical poetry, and to find them in the places where there should have been some kind of love, that is to say erotic encounters, but that have become absolutely uh, dead or meaningless or, or crude, uh, is, is a way again of using ironically a past form, and this is where I, I tried also to make it more formal as a contrast with the rather squalid content that was presented. Now that you have given us different motives or different reasons of your um, need or urge to uh, retranslate the Westland and what you were trying to do, maybe just before we go into detail into your kitchen and see how you've done it, maybe you just wrap up giving what would, uh, Antoine Berman would say, what was your visé, your global um, view of the changes you wanted to, to bring to the general feeling of the poem. Um, like, um, wanted, like, what was the dominant uh, drive to, to reflect its disorganized organization, to try to find a unified voice, because it was said there is some kind of odd voice, or to make the um, uh, the different register heard everything in the same place, or you had to choose one of the challenge before the other. Uh, all the challenges together, always. Nothing is left. Um, uh, for me, the, the most important thing I said at the beginning was the variety of, of voices to make the difference uh, uh, between. Um, to, to render the differences between voices. Uh, in a sense, uh, Marie's uh, dramatic monologue must be different from Madame Sosostri's, as well as uh, the pressing rhythm of the Holy Scriptures must be different from the plain meditative, meditative uh, impersonal voice of the man thinking about uh, his time. Uh, in war. So uh, it is important to give these uh, differences, and at least in the Italian tr translations, I had the impression that there was a general tendency to make uh, everything sound uh, too poetic. Uh, and I mean with too poetic, uh, a 19th century idea of poetic. Mm? So uh, that kind of uh, uh, literary discourse sounded more like uh, Tennyson than <laughs> like modernist poetry with collage or montage. So the idea was to, you know, to make the differences uh, hurt uh, in the voices of the um, characters, but also in the voices of the impersonal voices that sometimes uh, interrupts the. So this was my uh, main idea, to, to, to take away the dust from the poem. <laughs> well, um, um, uh, I always uh, loved uh, the way uh, Eliot changes register uh, during uh, the poem. And uh, this I, uh, I must say, maybe uh, those of you also write poetry might agree, uh, this uh, is something that you, you can really learn from him. Uh, and uh, this was um, very important for me. There are other uh, poets, like in, in uh, Germany, uh, Gottfried Benn, he uses uh, very different registers, but not in one poem. Uh, so this is uh, what I really uh, learned from Eliot, and so this was... Um, uh, 
really like fun in, in, in the work to, to um, try to explore this in translating um, the, the poem. But on the other hand, to have behind or somewhere in the back as like a ghost, behind all these uh, different voices, uh, one tone which unifies uh, my translation or your translation. Uh, you, um, Elliot could uh, use this technique to uh, present so many different voices because he was Elliot. He had his voice even uh, w when we have difficulties finding him uh, in, in the poem. So there must be something, it's not... Um, easy to tell, something which um, makes it a translation that uh, uh, nobody else would have done in, in, in that way. So, uh, and, and I, uh, as I think I've already said, I wanted to um, bring it, it sound closer to our time, not too obvious, um, not too many effects, but some, be, uh, because um, of course, it will be retranslated. And uh, in uh, that's just this year, there uh, in the journal Schreibheft, there appeared uh, new translations by several poets of all of the burial of the dead. So um, this, I think, uh, I don't know if they want to go on with it. But of course, uh, my translation and our translations won't be the last in our languages. We we might fantasize that, but it it, it won't be. So and but this is a chance to um, 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 play with it a little bit, to playfully set some marks that uh, will. Uh, uh, tell the, about which time the translation has been done. Yes, I completely agree with you both. Um, as I said earlier, I tried to reproduce this uneasiness within his own language. I think it's very important. And at the same time, to keep and to, to render these different levels of a speech. And at the same time, this balance between the scattered voice scattered voices, the poem, and the aim of a unity, which is always present in Eliot. And you can feel um, that uh, there is a sort of disgregation, a destruction of the voice of the harmony. There is, uh, the Wasteland is a poem about the impossibility of singing, a negative song, but at the same time, especially in the last part, and in the in the final um, stanza, you can feel, you can hear how Eliot wants to sing again. So, to, so as it were, uh, to he's pointing to what he's going to 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 achieve in the four quartets somehow. And I don't know, but uh, one thing I was, um, apart from all these things that I was also interested in, the tensions, the discontinuity, the multivocal, etc. cetera, um, one thing I, I think is interesting also is to try and get the um, historicity of the words into your translation, um, that he is not just using different registers of language, but also words belonging to different periods and that uh, carry different memories. That's why, for example, I would not have used any word that I didn't think would have exist would not have existed in 1922. I think this would jar on your ear or your eye if you did it. Um, I'm also aware, and uh, when you spoke about this idea of Europe that he has, that it's also not universal in the sense that uh, he is using seven European or Indo-European languages, but he is excluding everything else. So again, this is something you have to. This is why well, it's interesting to have an Arabic word in the title in the Spanish, because this is the kind of thing he would not have done. And, and uh, so <laughs> you're doing him a service, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> he would have disliked that. And he's excluding as much. And I, I felt that, you know, when there's also all that he didn't put in and could have if he had wanted to. Um, but I think this idea of getting the words, um, this, this clash between contemporary English and uh, older words, like, uh, I don't know, the, the quotes at the end and the fragments, um, why then I'll fit you, Hieronymus Maligain, they're often quotes, of course, which he has uh, sometimes transformed. But they carry every time a kind of memory with them, and to try and get that um, 
difference between the words that are contemporary and those that aren't, those that have a memory, a specific kind of uh, memory, and those that haven't. I think that was kind of a challenge also. Now we, we, we have your, your visé, your general aim, what you attempted to, that could be sort of a foreword to your translation. And now we are very curious to enter the, um, the craftsman uh, job. So that's the time for the master class. Uh, so you decided to choose an excerpt which was emblematic of a challenge that you were very interested in. And you're going to explain how you defeated the challenge or negotiate with it or dealt with it. Uh, so that would be four for a short master class, but great master class. So, uh, who jump in first? I can, yes, in okay. I can jump in in my three minutes master class. Yes. <laughs> we have the Italian master class of the Westland. <laughs> oh, okay. <coughs> I decided to, to explain some of the choices that I made while translating the very uh, first seven lines of the poem. So I will read it in English, then I will read my translation and I will tell you what happened, how I tried to desperately save what got lost in translation. Uh, April is the coldest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, steering dull roots with spring rain, winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. My translation. Aprile è il mese più crudele, genera l'illà dalla terra morta, mescola memoria e desiderio, pungola radici ottuse con pioggia primaverile. L'inverno ci teneva al caldo, copriva la terra di neve dimentica, nutriva con tuberi secchi una vita minima. Okay, as you probably um, heard, I had to renounce, as most trans Italian translators usually do, uh, to the gerunds at the end of the line. You cannot use the ink form in Italian because it sounds too ambiguous. And so you have to use present tense. But somehow you're renouncing to the gerunds which are impersonal. Uh, verbal forms, so they are quite important in Elliot Poetics. So I tried at least to save the symmetry of the three uh, verbs at the end of the line, and I tried to use three verbs that uh, at least contain uh, the nasal sound of the English ink form. So we have genera with the N, mescola with the M, and pungola which contains the very same uh, sound of the English ink form. I also tried to, uh, to save the alliteration in E, the E sounds, which got lost and were in uh, breeding, in mixing, in steering, and is still very important in uh, winter covering, feeding. E is a very important sound in this part of the poem because it really uh, gives you the idea of how annoying the rain is, how, you know, how um, it is tormenting, in a sense. So I try to uh, sort of macrotextual <laughs> uh, attempt to save uh, this aspect of these lines. And I decided uh, at the end of the first line to use primaverile, which has a distant resonance with aprile, at the beginning of, uh, of the first line. And I also try to use, to decided to use imperfect forms, nutriva, copriva, which has the E sound. And I tried to create a sort of climax of alliteration at the end of the, fi of the seventh line with vita minima. Mm? So this was a sort of um, an example uh, of uh, trying to uh, recover what gets lost. So I put words sometimes not in their original position, 
but in the case of Primaverile in a stronger position at the end of the line because that position helped me to give more importance to something that got lost in its original place. So this is one um, example that I wanted to, uh, to make. Another very uh, short example that I want to make is not so formal or linguistic. It has more to do with opacity, but also probably with cultural aspects of translation. I'm talking about uh, the lines, uh, the famous lines on, on illegal abortion at the pub scene. Do you remember? Maybe the line is, it's 10 pills I took to bring it off, uh, she said. She's had five already and nearly died of young George. Line uh, 159, 160. It is interesting that in the previous translation, to bring it off has always been made explicit. Hmm? Male translators <laughs> <laughs> always uh, make it very explicit. And, you know, uh, probably it, is, uh, it mirrors an idea of translator of the translator task uh, that is to make the text more comprehensible. So I get it. But nowadays it really sounds, you know, awkward in a sense because it uh, threatens the realism of the scene. You would never have two women in a pub. You know, it is more something about the historicity and its importance. You would never have two women at a pub in 1922 using the word abortion or to abort, <laughs> uh, knowing that it's illegal, no? So uh, if the text is ambiguous, uh, sometimes it is very important <laughs> to leave it ambiguous because it is a cultural mark what what, pos what pos was possible to say or not to say at the time. So uh, this is probably something that is changing uh, in the translation styles nowadays, and I think that's a good thing. Sh should I? Okay. Um, well, I would like to point to um, a three little um, uh, spots in the poem um, where I um, made, um, where I opted f uh, for deviations from the literal meaning <coughs> because uh, I, I thought I had to do so. Uh, I start with the very first line, not even the whole line. April is the cruelest month, the first sentence. Um, well, um, in, let's start with the first word. Uh, April and April uh, in, in German. Uh, I think, like in your languages as well, or yeah, yes. So we we are we are um, unified in stressing the second syllable, but the English don't. So um, so this is um, trochaic rhythm. April is the cruelest month, like you said before, uh, but you can't do it in German. Uh, April. This this was the first uh, thing that. That struck me. Um, the second, uh, and I thought about this for a long time, and maybe I, I uh, was reluctant to do the whole translation because when you don't do how the to do the first line in every writing, it, it's difficult. Uh, which um, is the translation of cruelist. Um, I think uh, Ernst Robert Kozia says obviously the correct German translation, April is der grausamste Monat. It's not uh, absolutely uh, not debatable that this is the correct uh, translation, but uh, ah, it didn't make me happy. I wanted to do some, something else because uh, it sounds to me more the, uh, uh, like a paraphrase than like a poetic line. And so I, um, uh, I did... Um, my my uh, version is April is the übelste Monat, but it's not the, the whole of my version. But um, the übelste, uh, it, it's not quite the same like uh, cruel, grausam. It's more the most nasty, the most bad. Uh, and I um, had uh, to take some time why I wanted the übelste. Uh, then I said it was uh, about uh, rhyme because... There is a hidden rhyme um, in Eliot's first sentence, April is cruelist. So I wanted the 
übelste, um, cruelest übelste. So it, it sounds, it's much more close in sound like cruelest and grausam, which sounds very grausam to me. So, uh, but then uh, I also had a problem with monat uh, instead of month. Um, I, I hated uh, suddenly the second unstressed syllable. It, it sounds so dull, monat. So, and, and I had to do, to do something more. So I did, April is the übelste monat von allen. Well, von allen, of all. Um, Elliot uh, doesn't have that, so... Uh, but I, I felt I, I must have that. And then I um, <laughs> recognized, uh, m maybe Elliot forgot. Um, uh, and, and then, then I, um, uh, I'm, I um, saw the symmetry when you uh, try to, to imagine, uh, to, to note the stresses. April, April is the cruelest month. April is the übelst monat von allen. So it's symmetric, and I, of course I chose dactyls uh, instead of the uh, trochees. And then second from the fire sermon, the um, very beautiful eight lines, she turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly, and paces about her room again, alone. She smooths her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. Sie dreht sich um und schaut kurz in den Spiegel, denkt an den Lover kaum, der eben durch die Tür. Ihr Hirn formt nur den einen Halbgedanken, geschafft, und ich bin froh, jetzt habe ich's hinter mir. Wenn Pretty Woman sich getäuscht hat und ein paar Runden dreht in ihrem Raum allein, streicht sie die Haare automatisch glatt und legt noch einmal die Kassette ein. Well, um, in, in these eight lines I, um, I had to do two or even three things that you might say you cannot do that. Um, um, I think what really annoyed some critics was that I... Um, uh, changed the um, allusion to Goldsmith uh, uh, to a different allusion to a uh, Hollywood film, which of course Elliot uh, could not uh, see, but I think he, he would have liked to see it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, and and I uh, and I, I I felt the right to do so because um, um, in a German audience will never understand any allusion to Goldsmith. So I, I wanted an, an allusion maybe more in the sense like we heard yesterday um, from Jamie's, um, uh, from what Jamie told us in, in the way Elliot would have done in Proofrock so that everybody understands the allusion. And then I changed, uh, at the end, I exchanged uh, gramophone for cassette, so I, for tape recorder, which, of course, Elliot couldn't use but might have liked to use. I don't know. But uh, I did this, um, I think, because of the rhyme, because um, alone, a line. It had to be a line. But I wanted um, a pure rhyme at the end, and so did this ein, uh, you cannot... Um, with the gramophone, um, man legt die Platte auf im Deutschen. So I, I had the cassette and I, and I liked it. And then I, um, which is not so dramatic, but I chose to keep the lover in German, which in German is very colloquial, of course. And uh, one uh, last example from um, what the Thunder said, um, there's two or three lines. Uh, 300 and um, be between 380 and 90, and upside down in air were towers, tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours, and voices singing of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. So my uh, problem uh, was the um, to the equivalent for um, bells and the rhyme bells wells. Um, in German, the um, first translation of bells is Glocken, uh, bell, Glocke, which is quite obvious, uh, but it doesn't rhyme. Um, but we also have the word Schelle, which is also quite close to, to Glocke, but you uh, can't say reminiscent bells, um, Gedächtnis Schelle. 
So I chose to um, to take them both to to keep the um, meaning and the sound. So I did. Und in der Luft die umgestürzten Türme schlugen die Gedächtnisglocke, Schelle, die die Stunden band, und Stimmen aus leeren Zisternen sangen und versiegter Quelle. So. Um, I've chosen uh, the opening stanzas of the second part of the poem, A Game of uh, Chess, which is in part, uh, in fact, uh, the, the first part of this section, uh, the, the previous to the Papa's Sin. And as we all know, here Elliot begins with a description of a woman seated in her boudoir, uh, brushing her hair in front of, of a glass in a, in a luxury uh, atmosphere. The place is full of perfumes, of jewels, uh, unguents. Um, the atmosphere is highly um, erotic. One can smell beauty and, and desire. There is even a reference to Philomel, which is a myth about rape. And actually, uh, Eliot sees here, as he himself points um, in, in his notes, a passage, he's imitating a passage of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, uh, precisely the moment when Enobarbo describes Cleopatra sailing slowly in a river when she's about to meet Antony for the first time, which is going to be a coup de foudre. Um, Antony and Cleopatra is the most sexual among the greatest uh, Shakespearean tragedies. Um, it is a tragedy, in fact, about desire, about sexual madness, about sexual happiness as well. And to describe Cleopatra in Obarbo uses a very sophisticated language, uh, very bombastic, very artificial in a way. And in doing so, Shakespeare was, um, in his turn, somehow mocking the uh, highest style of the uh, 15th uh, century English literature, what by that time was called Euphuism, uh, which is a current of a style um, cultivated by others, by such authors as uh, John Lilly, for instance. So Eliot is um, working here with very different levels of speech in a very ironical way, in order to prepare the reader to the sudden eruption of the sordid dialogue between a married couple that cannot bear each other anymore. So we pass suddenly uh, from a very quiet and warm and erotic scene, written in a yambic, mellow, sophisticated style, to a very unpoetic, violent, sordid argument of a sick couple. The voice of the woman is physical. She speaks with the nerves, uh, with a sick body, whereas the man uh, remains silent, uh, speaking for himself only, unable to reply. He is when he says, I cannot connect nothing with nothing, which is one of the main problems of the poem and of the tradition in that moment, in Eliot's time. So there is a strong sense of frustration and even of impotence through the whole sequence. Uh, the poetic world of sexual fulfillment that Antony and Cleopatra represent and is no longer possible. The translation must show, I think, these nuances and uh, from this ironic, meditative first level of a speech, that lost world of harmony and beauty, even to the ear, which tells us that that kind of poetry, that way of thinking, is no more available. This transition to, uh, I think, a good translation has to observe um, very cutely, this transition, this rough transition to the dry, sharp uh, style of the of the marital scene. Mm? So it goes. It goes like this in my transition. El sitial en que ella se sentaba, cual trono bruñido, resplandecía en el mármol donde el espejo con soportes labrados de racimos de uva entre los que asomaba un dorado cupido, 
tras su ala escondía Otto sus ojos, duplicaba las llamas de un candelabro de siete brazos que reflejaba una luz en la mesa a cuyo encuentro emergía el fulgor de sus joyas en rica profusión vertidas con estuches de raso. En frascos de marfil y cristal policromo destapados fluían sus extraños perfumes sintéticos, ungüentos, en polvo o líquidos, turbando, confundiendo y ahogando los sentidos en aromas que ascendían removidos por el frescor de la ventana, aumentando las largas llamas de las velas cuyo humo elevaban hasta el artesonado, conmoviendo el dibujo de los techos encofrados. Enormes troncos marinos llenos de cobre ardían en verde y naranja, enmarcados por la coloreada piedra en cuya triste luz un labrado delfín nadaba. Como una ventana que diera la escena silvestre, sobre la repisa antigua se contemplaba la mutación de Filomela por el rey bárbaro tan brutalmente forzada. Pero allí el ruiseñor llenaba el desierto con voz inviolable y aún gritaba ella y aún busca el mundo, yac, yac, a oídos sucios. Y de otros podridos tocones de tiempo se hablaban las paredes, formas que miran, sobresalen, se inclinan, silencian la estancia cercada. Rumor de pasos en la escalera, bajo la luz del fuego, bajo el cepillo, su cabello transido de puntos ardientes resplandecía en las palabras, luego, salvaje, se aquietaba. And then, the sudden eruption of this uh, sordid dialogue. Estoy mal de los nervios esta noche. Sí, mal, no te vayas. Di algo. ¿Por qué no hablas nunca? Di. ¿En qué estás pensando? ¿Qué piensas? ¿Qué? Nunca sé qué piensas. Piensa. Antaman, pienso que estamos en el callejón de las ratas, donde los muertos perdieron los huesos. ¿Qué es ese ruido? El viento en la puerta. ¿Y ese otro ruido? ¿Qué hace el viento? Nada, otra vez nada. ¿No sabes nada? ¿No ves nada? ¿No recuerdas nada? And then Elliot says, I remember... Those are pearls that were his eyes. Of course, it's a quote uh, of Shakespeare, of Ariel's song. The full fed on five, thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those were pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him thus changed, but thus suffered a sea change into something rich and strange. See him sourly ring his knell. Hark, now I can hear them. Ding dong, bell. Which is probably the most beautiful, well crafted lyric ever written. And then appears here like a rest, like a ruin of a lost world, the lost world of the first scene, not in, 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 an, in, in, an, in an ironic uh, level here, but in a very dramatic one. One can compare maybe this device with the tonal and uh, atonal music. Hmm? Um, suddenly, there is a way of doing music that was impossible by uh, the time Eliot was writing, was writing uh, the, the Wasteland and before. Uh, Stravinsky was very important for him, for instance. And I think that all of, the, all of these nuances uh, of quite different uh, significance in every level of a speech, one uh, has to uh, render in translation and that's what I've tried to do. Um, we'll finish the masterclass session with Benoit. It's not really a masterclass. As far as I'm concerned, it's more of a, a, um, a recognition that I, uh, my translation is not quite what I would have liked it to have been. Um, because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you sort of get it in print or on, on the web and then you, you continue thinking about it and you start realizing that perhaps if you were to do it now, you'd do it differently. So That's it, translation <laughs> live. Yes. Mm. So you have to turn the page somehow and think about other things. But I'm, it's interesting because I've chosen the same part that Andrew just oh, discussed. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's uh, because I think it connects quite well. I'm, I've chosen just to read a bit of the this this neurotic dialogue that you mentioned, which I'll read first in English, then in French, and then I'll just sort of point to a couple of difficulties which um, I think are interesting to think about because... Um, it's hard to render the ambiguities into French, and so you have to make choices, and these choices um, change the way you understand the text. So this is what I would like to, to basically try and suggest. So this is how it goes. My nerves are bad tonight. We've had it in Spanish already. Yes, bad, stay with me, speak to me. Why do you never speak, speak? What are you thinking of, what thinking, what? I never know what you're thinking, think. I think we are in Rat's Alley, where the dead men lost their bones. What is that noise? The wind under the door. 
What is that noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing again, nothing. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? I remember, those are pearls that were his eyes. Are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? But, oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag, it's so elegant, so intelligent. This is where I, I stop, it's already more than enough. And um, so, a couple of things, um, no, I should, perhaps I should read my translation, it's sort of a, <laughs> a Freudian slip there. Um, there it goes. J'ai mal au nerf ce soir. Oui, mal. Reste avec moi. Parle-moi. Pourquoi tu ne parles jamais Parle. À quoi est-ce que tu penses À quoi tu penses À quoi Je ne sais jamais à quoi tu penses. Pense. Je pense que nous sommes dans la tranchée des rats où les hommes morts ont perdu leurs os. Qu'est-ce que c'est que ce bruit Le vent sous la porte. Qu'est-ce que ce bruit-là Que fait le vent Rien toujours, rien. Ne sais-tu rien Ne vois-tu rien Ne te rappelles-tu rien je me rappelle, ses yeux sont devenus des perles. Es-tu vivant ou non N'y a-t-il rien dans ta tête Sauf, oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag, c'est si, si élégant, si intelligent. Donc là, il y a plusieurs problèmes, en fait, de compréhension euh, qui déterminent un peu la manière dont on peut essayer de traduire ce texte. D'abord, euh, on peut se poser la question de savoir... Uh, sorry, yes. I'm sort of carrying on. Sorry, it was too easy like that. Yeah, I have to go back to English. Um, There's some uh, problems of understanding, uh, understanding who's speaking, first of all. It's not necessarily that obvious. There are ambiguities and possibilities. It could be, as you said, a, a, a dialogue between husband and wife. It could be a dialogue where one is speaking and the other is thinking. It could even be a schizophrenic dialogue between the woman and her own self. All these are possibilities. Um, just to keep in mind that this is a, a passage where I think um, there are many ambiguities, and the ambiguities are really essential to the richness of the passage. Um, and another one is an ambiguity between two styles, or a superimposition or ambivalence uh, uh, between two styles. The neurotic discourse, which with its foreshortenings um, and repetitions, and the uh, iambic pentameter as well, which you get in the first two lines, for example, speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. It's not regular rhymes, but it is a pentameter, and you can scan it in five meters. Um, so on the one hand, you've got this sort of discourse of neurotic disease and mania. On the other hand, you have uh, an echo of an old uh, first tradition. So this is why I chose to render this as a uh, uh, Alexandrin. Parle-moi, uh, pourquoi tu ne parles jamais, parle. It's a 12-syllable line. It doesn't sort of strike the ear as particularly literary, but it is nevertheless a, a, a sort of regular Alexandrin, a dodica syllable, which functions in that system that I alluded to earlier, where I sort of try and give an equivalent of the pentameter with the uh, Alexandrin. But then we come to uh, perhaps more difficult things that we have to try and um, uh, account for or think about. Um, there's, um, for example, the use of nothing, which creates a syntactic ambiguity, um, because you can understand, do you know nothing in two ways, uh, either in a sort of obvious way as don't you know anything, and uh, but also in a positive way as do you know nothing? Do you know nothingness? Do you know the nothing, if you like? Which uh, gives a totally different vision of the poem, if you think about it. Um, do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? It's really a word that rings through the poem from the very beginning with the high synth girl and the response of the man. Another, um, if it's just a man responding to the woman, this again could be discussed. But anyway, um, when he says, um, I was neither living nor dead, and I knew nothing, looking into the heart of light, the silence. I knew nothing could mean I didn't know anything, but also perhaps I knew the nothingness at the core of the world. And if we think that uh, Eliot was studying Buddhism uh, a few years before that at Harvard with a Japanese master, uh, we might think that perhaps there is here some kind of Zen idea of... Um, getting out of this cycle of reincarnation and life and death by achieving extinction, by achieving the nirvana and, and Buddhism. So perhaps if we think in those terms, we could also see it positively. 
Um, and the same with I can connect nothing with nothing. Uh, that perhaps could also be uh, either an admission of incapacity or on the contrary of some kind of illumination. Um, so I think we, if we are reading the poem in English, we don't have to choose between these readings. We have to, we can consider both, and this is part of the, our, the richness of our experience in reading the poem. But when we come to the thankless task, which is the translators, it is much more difficult to do. Um, and I actually um, wavered between the two. When I had to translate, I can connect nothing with nothing. I didn't put the negation. I put uh, uh, connecter rien avec rien et non pas ne connecter, so no negation. But in that part, I sort of chickened down and I put um, ne sais-tu rien, ne vois-tu rien, ne te rappelles-tu rien. And now I would be tempted to say sais-tu rien, vois-tu rien, te rappelles-tu rien, uh, which could be uh, an indication of a possible uh, interpretation of nothing in positive terms. I've also been inspired by this book, which is called Nothing, which I recommend to uh, uh, all of you, which is a, a sort of collection of essays published by The New Scientist and edited by Jeremy Webb. I could just read from the cover where he says, for centuries, cent scientists have known that nothing may in fact be the key to understanding everything, from the true nature of consciousness to the expansion of the cosmos. Because without nothing, or rather, what we've long taken to be nothing, would be literally nowhere. Which I think is a pretty good way of um, looking at it uh, as well. I'll just like to conclude with other difficulties, um, which have to do with the use of language. Um, as you mentioned, there is that quote from Shakespeare and there is the Shakespearean rag, which is also another quotation. But do we read them as quotes or do we read them as being spoken by the speaker, uh, as in used by him or her? Um, for example, here we can understand, I remember those are pearls that were his eyes, either as part of the speaker's discourse, that is to say, I remember that those are pearls that were his eyes. So he's using the words, himself or herself, or she or he, and or uh, I remember the phrase from Shakespeare that was quoted with invisible quotation marks. And the same goes with that Shakespearean, that Shakespearean rag. Oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag is here a clear quotation of the title, but then it's so elegant, so intelligent, is that um, a, a, a quote also of the words of the song, which actually um, are... Um, Almost the same, but not quite, if I, I have it somewhere. Um, the song goes, most intelligent, very elegant. So it's not quite the same. And the fact that it has been reappropriated re and transformed suggests that in this case, it is not a quote, but it is actually the person who speaks who thinks that that rag is very elegant and very intelligent and not quoting from the rag itself. It sounds like a bit sort of obscure, what all I'm saying, but it, it, it of course, uh, means that you have to decide. In my case, uh, when there were quotes, I kept them in English. And when uh, I thought the quotes were reused as uh, active language, if you like, by the speakers, I translated them to French, which is why I put in my translation, oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag, C'est si élégant, si intelligent, and not the full uh, part in English. A last thing perhaps has to do with Rats Alley, but Jennifer discussed that quite well today. Um, Rats Alley um, is literally l'impasse or la ruelle des rats, but, um, and this is one instance where I did go and look at Christopher Rick's footnotes, and, um, and there is a footnote that says that it was the name of a trench in the Somme, during World War I, uh, Rats Alley, where the dead men lost their bones. And I thought, there I must put tranché, because we really must have this feeling that this is a post-World War I poem. And it gives a different perception to the idea of losing your bones. That is to say, that whole idea that there's so many uh, unrecognized, unknown uh, soldiers who have been actually buried in the trenches, and nobody knows where they are. It's part, I think, of the traumatic legacy of wars that um, that you find in poetry, you already found in Whitman when he was discussing the Civil War, that these soldiers have not been found or identified and that their bones have therefore been lost since it is through the bones that you remember people like saints and relics and stuff like that. So that's where I went a bit further than what the text actually said to put tranché and not um, simply uh, ruelle or whatever. Well, that's that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Benoit Carmen. 
uh, Andreu and uh, Norbert. Uh, I think we, we have here a very high quality panel and I'm not boasting uh, the composition of the panel, but because you have here translators who have the ambition to green their teeth against quite a monument of uh, our literary tradition and uh, patrimony, and the humility to acknowledge that their work is transient. And that opens the field for you to ask questions because they have opened up for you their drawers, their notes, their way of working, and you might have a um, question to add because I don't have any more, I can ask any more questions. And we can take some from um, the internet as well if there are any. And, but here I can't see you, so I don't know if anybody is raising their hand. Do you have a question? All right. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this exciting conversation. Wonderful. Um, I, uh, I have a specific question to Carmen and another question to all of you, especially Norbert, Carmen, and Benoit, I think, because I am not quite sure about Spanish in the wasteland. So the general question is, what have you done? What did you do with the um, quotations from other languages? How does French work in French text? How does German work in German text? But the specific Question to Carmen is, um, could you speak more about the experience of a woman translating the wasteland? Uh, and I'm asking that because you are the first woman I, who translated the wasteland. I know I have a chance to meet and to talk to. All Polish translators of the poem are men. And I have an impression, not all Spanish translators are men, but uh, out of the 35, the wonderful 35, <laughs> there are some women. But, but I think that it's a very male um, uh, kind of job to, to read T.S. Eliot and to translate T.S. Eliot. So could you please speak a little bit more about that? Thank you very much. I'll try. Um, actually, uh, I'm, I'm not really the first. There was another woman, uh, but she's, she's a poet, not an English scholar. That is Aymara Garlaskelli, who did a translation uh, which I not really agree with, but it's important that she did it. And uh, it is uh, um, interesting that, uh, like a month ago, another female poet translated the wasteland, uh, um, Sara Vintroni. So something is changing, probably. Um, uh, also in this case, is a poet, not a scholar. But still, I, I think it's interesting, uh, this fact that more women feel allowed <laughs> to translate the wasteland. There is something disturbing in the wasteland for women. It is now it's very easy to say. And um, but I think I think I thought at the time when I decided to translate it that is something that must be done on classics which were usually uh, translated or studied only by men. Because uh, there are some ways to look at things that, they, that can be changed. Not because a woman has a special or it is more sensible or, or the stereotypes that can be connected to that. But for example, the neurotic dialogue, it can also be interpreted in a different way like uh, a woman looking for a sort of sharing of the man's traumas of war and the man's unavailability to that sharing. That uh, unavailability is what provokes the neurotic reaction, in a sense. So I'm not saying, uh, no, I don't want to say who's the victim there. It's not that the point. The point is that it is a dialogue and both are somehow aggressive to the other. And maybe that's a way uh, in which we can read some parts of the poem in different ways. 
not only in translation, but also in the commentary. Sometimes I had the impression that there is a sort of tendency to edulcorate some images, those related to rape. In the commentary, it sounds like something that happened, no? Just in the literary tradition. Yeah? The, not really something, no, that, that still happens today. While sometimes just using um, rape instead of violating, no? it can be a, a way to give, uh, to, <laughs> to um, make the violence of the thing still present in the comment and in the image that we are. So uh, these are the first things that come to my mind about translating. It's not that you know there is uh, really something that is better, but as I said, uh, also as a woman, there are maybe some doors that can be opened by some keys because we have a different kind of experience and also a different relationship with literary tradition, which always represented women in a certain kind. I, I always say that in the wastelands there are no women, there are female figures. Hmm? Those of the, you know, imagined by, through literary tradition, and those imagined by a man that needs those female figures to talk about something else. But it is, you know, appropriate, uh, but not so much to reflect on women in the wasteland as real character, because I'm not sure they are. They're just figures, metaphors. They stand for something else, as, as it has always been in literary tradition. I'm not sure if I answered your questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, um, but I, I just have one question to you. Wouldn't you think, uh, say that Vivian is in the poem? I, I think that she is, Emily Hale is in the poem. But for example, what is interesting is in the facsimile edition, we are always talking about the notes by Pound, of course, because he did the, no, most of the job. But have you ever noticed how good are sometimes Vivian's notes? She adds uh, a few notes to the pub scene, which are crucial for the realism of the scene. About the even illegal abortion, Elliot had that stuff you took, and she suggests the pills. So very few notes, maybe which are not important, like the quatrains destroyed by Pound, but still. Mm? Vivian at least is in the wasteland, also as a sort of editor, a minor editor, but still her presence is in the poem. Also as a voice, we, we just listen to it. Yeah. Is there nothing in her head that's Vivian? Who else? Yeah, that's, that's the, uh, <laughs> the poet's idea of a woman. It's not Vivian. Mm. <laughs> Sorry to say that. Somehow, it's not really Vivian. It's what Eliot used this kind of conjugal dialogue to talk about some, something else. It's not talking about how some, uh, Vivian suffered, how she felt. It was not really what he, he was interested in, and it was his right not to be interested in that in the poem. But still, I'm not sure that Vivian, the real Vivian, whoever is the real Vivian, is in the poem. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's, turning, it's turning into a male. Uh, how would you call that, Carmen? <laughs> well, Pascal, you might have an idea. I want to share my idea here because I want to give the, the, the floor, the word. I've so got, I've got another question language. about the languages, yeah, perhaps. Languages. Um, yes, um, just to be very brief about that. For me, it wasn't so much a problem about the French language being retranslated into French because the lines are identified by the footnotes. So we don't need to put them in italics or anything to, make, to show that they are quotes like hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable mon frère, which also is a kind of really well known line. So whoever reads poetry would know that and who 
doesn't wouldn't read the wasteland anyway, so it doesn't really uh, matter so much. And the same with um, Le Prince d'Aquitaine à la Tour Abolie, which is another really famous line from Gérard de Nerval. Perhaps the Verlaine is less famous, but there is there's a footnote. Uh, the difficulty is more with the English lines, I would say, and um, and the English rotations. Uh, what do you do with those are pearls that wear his eyes, with uh, Hieronymo's mad again, with um, London Brits falling down, all these quotes which are not, uh, which are brought back into the poem. This is where you have to decide whether you translate them or not. Um, and I've chosen not to translate them when they are uh, quotations which are not tampered with. Like London Bridge is falling down, falling and falling, is, is the exact line from the nursery rhyme, so I've kept it in English. And of course, not to translate the other languages, but that's uh, that's the easy. The, the, the German bits remain in German, uh, the Sanskrit, and I wouldn't translate shanti, shanti, shanti. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a dangerous thing to do. <laughs> I've got two questions. Can yeah. I ask them? Um, um, uh, no. I would also uh, answer on this question, maybe. Um, uh, I, I thought it sometimes, um, well, I, I felt a bit sad that I couldn't do anything about uh, these foreign uh, quotes. And so now and then I played with them uh, just a little bit. Um, uh, and just one example is in the last line of the Burial of the Dead, I, I kept the English U, and, and but then I put in a little bit of German in between. So have, uh, we have three languages in this last line: U, hypocrite, lecteur, mein Ebenbild, mon frère. So, but just an example how I dealt with it. Okay, I'm going to uh, use the mic, which I'm, I, I know you can't see from where you're sitting, Pascal. The lights in your eyes, it's hard to see. Um, and I'm sorry if I interrupted with the mic. Um, so I have just two, two things. Uh, one, one person, one of you said that modernist texts need more translation than other texts. And I was, you know, at first I thought, yes. And then I thought, oh, I don't know, maybe not. How many translations of Dante are there? And, and so I just want to throw that up and be uh, disagreeable, but not, not really disagreeable. You can have fun with it. Uh, the other thing that might be disagreeable, but it's not also intended as disagreeable, is to ask you about Pound's influence on translating Eliot. Because maybe in each country that could be different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, because if I think about Pound in Italy, then it feels like, oh, well, of course, Eliot would be translated right away in Italy. But does that work in other European countries? I mean, or maybe there's no influence at all of Pound on translating Eliot. Maybe it's a really silly question. Go for it. Have fun. <laughs> well, just to answer your, your question, your doubt about what I said about um, modernist work, uh, that are more translatable than the classical ones, for instance, Dante. I don't mean that I, they can not be translated. Dante has been translated, and it has been uh, translated every year. In, in Spain, we have the most recently a, a big new translation. But I think that in order to, to, to grasp the sheer profundity of Dante, you have to learn some Italian, because you lose almost everything. It, uh, Dante is so much rooted in Italian language. And you can explain Dante through translation, as we explain Sophocles or Euripides or uh, Lucretius through translation. But I, I think there's, there's quite a big difference between what happens in modernity between, uh, from uh, 16th century onwards through the uh, translation of the Bible, etc., etc., that somehow um, defines modernity in translation, which doesn't happen before, as what I said. Not that one cannot translate Dante or uh, any other author of the, of the classical past. Concerning Pound, I'm just for France, because I think the case is very different in Italy, where the connotations are also different politically and the history. And But Pound in France made no mark either at all. Uh, he's the other main absent person, although he lived in Paris and he 
So you read an immovable feast by Hemingway that he used to visit him and stuff, but basically he saw, I think he saw mostly American writers, uh, or Ford, Maddox Ford, or people like that, but he, he didn't engage much with the French, and he wasn't translated much either. There's only very few texts that were published in French uh, before World War II. There's a very small bit in uh, Eugene Jolis' anthology of American poets, but he's buried there among 126 other American poets, so, and it's only one page. And there's very little, I think. Um, and it's only in the 60s that he was uh, discovered, you could say, um, in the late 60s, through um, Cahiers de Lerne and translations by De Nioche. And so all these were politically motivated, mostly, either... <laughs> either uh, extreme right, um, liking Pound for being a sort of pariah, or the extreme left sort of weirdly doing the same, and uh, as a kind of martyr, and etc., of Americans especially, and having been ill-treat the poet, put in a cage by the American forces, etc. So um, it's really a very, very late uh, reception, and by that time, I think that most people who liked Eliot wanted to actually um, create a distance between him. He was, Eliot was not a fascist, he was a conservative, and therefore he was not at all like Pound, and they, actually the connection was never really put forward much in France, I think. So, bizarrely, uh, what I think is a big, big difference is that Pound and Eliot are really conceived of as very different poets in France, whereas in, uh, in the English-speaking world, you would study them together and think of them as friends, etc. Um, I, wouldn't, I, w I wouldn't like to frustrate anybody if there is a um, last question uh, lurking in the obscurity of the room. Um, but we have, I've, I told you about a surprise, and we have a very special guest waiting, and I guess it's not too far, fair to have him waiting like that. And we have asked him his favorite part of the Westland. And we ask him to read it, and then maybe we'll give because we have so many languages in the room, give them, each of you, your, your transition of this piece. And, and for that, um, I'd like to, to ask um, Magda Hedl to join us on stage, uh, Dejan Slavik um, from Croatia, um, and Cesar Humpa Sanchez from Peru, they are going to read um, an excerpt of their own translation, and I'd like also Ruth Clements um, to read from Dutch. Magda is going to read from Polish, but first, maybe we'll, we'll hear the real ghost that haunt us, that been haunting us for a whole day and a half a day. What the thunder said. After the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison and palace, and reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains, he who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. Here is no water but only rock, rock and no water and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water we should stop and drink amongst the rock one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry and feet are in the sand. If there were only water amongst the rock, dead mountain mouse of carious teeth that cannot spit, here one can neither stand, nor lie, nor sit. There is not even silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud-cracked houses. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water, and water, a spring, a pool among the rock, 
If there were the sound of water only, not the cicada and dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock, where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 but there is no water. Okay, we might add that, so we, uh, these eight lines. Yes, you, okay. you, you read like, well, we decided to stop, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What the Sunder said to line 258. Okay, Carmen, go. Is it working? Yeah. Ciò che disse il tuono. Dopo la luce della torcia rossa su facce sudate, dopo il silenzio di gelo nei giardini, dopo l'agonia nei luoghi di pietra, le grida e i pianti, prigione e palazzo e riverberazione, di tuono, di primavera, sopra montagne distanti. Colui che era vivo adesso è morto, noi che eravamo vivi adesso stiamo morendo con un po' di pazienza. Qui non c'è acqua ma solo roccia, roccia e non acqua, è la strada di sabbia, la strada che si inerpica su tra le montagne, che sono montagne di roccia senza acqua. Se ci fosse acqua potremmo fermarci e bere, tra le rocce non puoi fermarti o pensare. Il sudore è secco e i piedi stanno nella sabbia, se ci fosse solo acqua tra le rocce. Morta a bocca di montagna, con i piedi cariati, che non sa sputare. Qui non si può stare, in piedi, né sdraiati, né seduti, non c'è nemmeno silenzio tra le montagne. Solo un suono, un tuono secco, sterile, senza pioggia. Non c'è nemmeno solitudine tra le montagne. Solo facce rosse scontrose che ghignano e ringhiano da porte di case di fango crepato. Se ci fosse acqua e nessuna roccia, se ci fosse roccia e anche acqua, e acqua è una fonte, una pozza tra le rocce, se ci fosse il suono dell'acqua soltanto, non la cicala e il canto dell'erba secca, ma suono d'acqua sopra una roccia, dove il tordo eremita canta tra i pini, clof, clop, clof, clop, 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 ma non c'è acqua. Según dijo el trueno, tras la roja luz de antorcha en caras sudorosas, tras el silencio escarchado en los jardines, tras la agonía en los pedregales, los gritos y los llantos, prisión y palacio y reverbero, de trueno primaveral en montañas lejanas, quien estaba vivo está ya muerto, nosotros vivíamos y estamos muriendo con un poco de paciencia. Aquí no hay agua, sino solo roca. Roca sin agua y el camino de arena, el camino que serpentea arriba en las montañas, que son montañas de roca sin agua. Si hubiera agua nos sentaríamos a beber, en medio de la roca no puede uno parar o pensar, seco está el sudor y los pies en la arena. Si por lo menos hubiera agua entre la roca, muerta, montaña con boca llena de caries que no puede escupir. Uno no puede aquí estar ni hacer ni sentarse, no hay siquiera silencio en las montañas, sino seco, trueno, estéril sin lluvia. No hay siquiera soledad en las montañas, sino muecas en oscas caras que gruñen, en puertas de casas de barro con grietas. Si hubiera agua, en vez de roca. Si hubiera roca y también agua, y agua, un manantial, una poza entre la roca, si por lo menos se oyera el sonido del agua, no la cigarra y la hierba seca cantando. Sino el agua resonante sobre una roca, donde canta el zorzal ermitaño en los pinares. Trip, trop, trip, trop, 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 pero no hay agua. Was der Donner sagte. Nach den Fackellichtern rot auf Schweißgesichtern, nach der frostigen Stille der Gärten, nach der Qual an steinigen Städten, dem Schreien und Weinen, Kerker und Palast und Widerhall, des Frühjahrsdonners über fernen Bergen, ist der, der lebte, nun gestorben. Sind wir, die lebten, nun am Sterben, gedulden uns nur noch. Hier ist kein Wasser, sondern nur Fels. Fels und kein Wasser und die sandige Straße. Die Straße windet sich hoch in die Berge, die Felsgebirge ohne Wasser sind. Wäre hier Wasser, könnten wir halten und trinken. Man kann in den Felsen nicht halten noch denken. Trocken der Schweiß und die Füße im Sand. Wäre doch nur Wasser hier zwischen den Felsen, 
Toter Bergmund, fauler Zähne, kann nicht spritzen. Hier kann man nicht stehen, nicht liegen, nicht sitzen. Nicht einmal Stille ist in den Bergen, nur trockener, unfruchtbarer Donner ohne Regen. Nicht einmal Einsamkeit ist in den Bergen, nur rote, mürrische Gesichter höhnen und spotten. Aus Türen rissiger Lehmhäuser. Wenn Wasser wäre und kein Fels, wenn Fels wäre, aber auch Wasser und Wasser, eine Quelle, ein Tempel im Fels, wenn doch nur das Geräusch von Wasser wäre, nicht die Zikade und dürres Gras sengen, nur das Geräusch von Wasser auf Fels, wo die Einsiedlerdrossel in den Kiefern singt, drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 doch da ist kein Wasser. Wat de donder zei. Na het fakkelicht rood op bezweten gezichten. Na de ijzige stilte in de tuinen. Na de pijn op steenachtige plaatsen. Het schreeuwen en het huilen. Gevangenis en paleis en galm. Van de donderachtige lente over verre bergen. Hij die leefde is nu dood. Wij die leefden gaan nu dood met een beetje geduld. Hier is geen water, maar alleen rots. Rots en geen water en de zandweeg, de weeg die boven de bergen slingert. Wat zijn rotsbergen zonder water? Als er water was, zouden we moeten stoppen en drinken. Tussen de rotsen kan men niet stoppen of denken... Zweet is droog en vuute in het zand. Was er maar water tussen de rotsen. Dode bergman van carieuze tanden die niet kunnen spugen. Hier kan men niet staan, liggen of zitten. Zelfs in de bergen is het niet stil. Maar droge, steriele donden zonder regen. Er is niet eens eenzaamheid in de bergen. Maar rode Noorse gezichten spotten en grommen van deuren van modderige huizen. Als er water was en geen rots. Als er rots was en ook water. En water, een bron, een plaats tussen de rotsen. Als er alleen het geluid van water was. Niet de cicade en droog gras zingende. Maar geluid van water over een rots. Waar de herremietlijster zingt in de pijnbomen. Druppel, 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 druppel. Maar er is geen water. Lo que dijo el trueno. Después de la antorcha roja sobre los rostros sudorosos. Después del silencio frigorífico en los jardines. Después de la agonía en los lugares pedregosos, el griterío y el lloriqueo, prisión y palacio y reverberación, del trueno primaveral sobre las montañas distantes. Aquel que estaba vivo está ahora muerto. Nosotros que estuvimos vivos estamos ahora muriendo, con un poquito de paciencia. Aquí no hay agua, solo roca. Roca y no agua y la ruta arenosa. La ruta enredándose sobre las montañas, las cuales son montañas rocosas sin agua. Si hubiese agua, deberíamos detenernos y beber. Entre las rocas, uno no puede detenerse o pensar. El sudor está seco y los pies están en la arena. Si tan solo hubiese agua entre la roca, boca de montaña muerta con dientes cariados que no escupen. Aquí nadie puede estar parado, echado o sentado. No hay siquiera silencio en las montañas, pero solo el seco estéril trueno sin lluvia. No hay siquiera soledad en las montañas, sino rojos rostros henchidos, burlando, gruñendo, desde las puertas de casas cascanueces. Si tan solo hubiese agua y no roca, si hubiese roca y también agua, y agua, una fuente, una piscina entre la roca, si hubiese solamente el sonido del agua, no la cigarra, y el césped seco cantando, aunque el sonido del agua sobre piedra, donde el tordo ermitaño canta en los pinos, drip, Drop, drip, drop, 
drop, drop, drop. Pero no hay agua. Što je rekao Grom nakon crvena svjetla zubalja na znojnim licima, nakon tišine pune mraza u vrtovima, nakon agonije u kamenitim mjestima, nakon krikova i povika, nakon zatvora i palače i jeka, groma u proljeće z dalekih planina, on koji je živio sada je mrtav. Mi koji smo živjeli sada umiremo s malo strpljivosti. Ovdje nema vode, nego je samo stijena. Stijena je ovdje, a ne voda i prašnjava je cesta. Cesta koja zavija među planinama. A te su planine pune stijena, a bez voda. Kad bi ovdje bilo vode, mi bismo i stali i pili. Među stijenama ti ne možeš niti zastati. Među stijenama ti ne možeš niti misliti. Zno je zato suh i stopala su usred pijeska kad bi samo bilo vode među stijenama. Mrtva usta planina i zubi puni karjesa ne mogu niti pljunuti. Ovdje ne možeš niti stajati, niti ležati, niti sjediti. Nema niti šine u tim planinama. Nego čuješ suh i neplodan grom bez dažda. Nema ni samoće u tim planinama. Nego vidiš crvena podbuhla lica koja reže puna poruga Svrata ovih hiža napravljenih od skrutnu toga blata, kada bi samo ovdje bila voda, a ne stijena. Kada bi bila stijena i također voda i voda i izvor. Jezerce usred stijena, kada bi se samo čula voda, a ne ta izrikavac i suha trava koja pjeva, da je samo čuti glas vode sa stijena. Gdje drost pustinjak pjeva u stablima borova stijena, Drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 drop. Ali ovdje nema vode. I'm reading Czesław Miłosz's translation. Co powiedział Grom? Po krwawym blasku pochodni na spoconych twarzach, po mroźnej ciszy w ogrodach, po agonii wśród kamiennych okolic, po wrzasku i płakaniu, po więzieniu, pałacu i echu, grzmotu wiosennego na dalekich górach, ten, kto był żywy, teraz jest umarły. Którzyśmy żywi byli, teraz umieramy. Cierpliwości tylko odrobinę. Tu nie ma wody, tutaj tylko skała. Skała i nie ma wody. I droga piaszczysta. Wije się wyżej między ścianą gór. Góry są skalne, góry są bez wody. Gdyby tu była woda, stanąć by i pić. Wśród skał stanąć, pomyśleć nie potrafi nikt. Suchy jest pot, nogi grzęzną w piasku. Gdyby tu była woda, płynęła ze skał. Martwa jest paszcza gór i nigdy nie pluje. Stanąć, usiąść, nie leżeć, nikt tu nie próbuje. Tutaj w tych górach ciszy nawet nie ma. Tylko suchy, jałowy grzmot bez deszczu. Tu samotności w górach nawet nie ma. Czerwone, mroczne twarze kpią i warczą za drzwi spękanych, glinianych lepianek. Gdybyż to woda, a nie skała. Gdybyż to skała, ale i woda, i woda, źródło, krynica u skał. Gdyby tu był chociażby dźwięk płynącej wody, nie głos cykady i śpiew suchych traw, ale dźwięk wody bijącej o skałę, gdzie drost pustelnik z między sosen śpiewa Kap, 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 ale nie ma wody. Ce qu'a dit le tonnerre. Après la lueur des torches rouges sur des faces suantes, après le silence glacial dans les jardins, après l'agonie dans des lieux de pierre, les crises et les pleurs, prisons et palais et réverbérations du tonnerre de printemps sur des montagnes lointaines, lui qui était vivant est mort maintenant. Nous qui étions vivants mourrons maintenant avec un peu de patience. Il n'y a pas d'eau ici, mais seulement du roc. Du roc et pas d'eau et la route de sable, la route tournant là-haut dans les montagnes qui sont des montagnes de roc sans eau. S'il y avait de l'eau, on s'arrêterait pour se rafraîchir. Parmi le roc, on ne peut s'arrêter pour réfléchir. La sueur est sèche et les pieds sont dans le sable. S'il y avait seulement de l'eau parmi le roc, morte montagne, bouche aux dents carriées qui ne peut cracher, 
Ici, on ne peut être debout, ni assis, ni couché. Il n'y a pas même de silence dans les montagnes, mais du tonnerre sec et stérile sans pluie. Il n'y a pas même de solitude dans les montagnes, mais des faces rouges renfrognées grognent et grondent aux portes de maisons de terre craquelées. S'il y avait de l'eau et pas de roc, s'il y avait du roc et aussi de l'eau, et de l'eau, une source, un bassin parmi le roc, s'il y avait le bruit de l'eau seulement, pas la cigale et l'herbe sèche qui chantent, mais le bruit de l'eau sur le roc, là où la grille vermite chante dans les pins, drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 mais il n'y a pas d'eau. Thank you very much. Um, I realize um, it, it's supposed to be Eliot's favorite passage of the Westland. Um, I must say it's not the cheeriest one, <laughs> but it shows somehow how relevant he is today. It somewhat resonates uh, among us, and um, I would say that fortunately. Um, there is water, and there is wine, and there is beer outside of here, and maybe, uh, but before we run out of, to the pub, uh, we might have a last word uh, from Antoine, but... Yes. It's very hard to give the last word to such a conference, to any conference. Uh, famous last word. <laughs> um, no, but truly, this was, uh, I think, two very great days, intense days, and a wonderful tribute both to T.S. Eliot and to translation. Uh, I think both were uh, really showcased very beautifully, beautifully by all the speakers coming from so many different countries. I think we are privileged uh, to have been able to attend uh, these two days and benefit from all the insights of uh, the specialists, the translators, both specialists slash translators of T.S. Eliot. It's a rare occasion to have so many of you in one room, and we're grateful for that. So my, my last word would be thank you, of course, and I can try to say the, to say the word in all the different languages that were on stage. So I can see Magda here, so dziękuję, I think it's in Polish, dziękuję, uh, grazie mille, merci beaucoup, chwala wam in Croatian, uh, danke vel in Dutch, and also, uh, am I forgetting someone? Thank you. Oh, German, danke schön. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the the largest, biggest uh, thank you must go to Pascal for putting together this conversation. The warmth of the applause says something about how beautifully the conference was managed and organized seamlessly despite all the things that you didn't see but that she had to cope with, like no breakfast this morning or that type of thing. So thank you very much. And now on to drinks. Yes? Thanks. That's it. That's all, folks.